Turn with me, if you would, uh, to your Bibles, to the book of Exodus, chapter 34. We're going to do things a little bit different this morning than how we normally do them. We also have something uh, fun, I say. I say fun. You guys may think it's, it's work. but uh. Exodus, chapter 34. Stand with me, if you would. Verses 29 to 32 is what we're going to read. And it says, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. And when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. And afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him. On the Mount Sinai. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that you will bless our time here this morning. Keep us safe as we travel back home, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I feel like coming off of that music, it's just like it just died all of a sudden because it was like exciting and now the pastor's up here talking. So, yeah, I know. Thanks. Um, well, what was Moses doing? On Mount Sinai, and, and, and really, we're going we're gonna to like take a, a break from this morning's sermon. We're going to come back to it, I promise, but we're going to take like a, we're going to like slap a little things, and we're going to take a break, okay, and we're going to do something else, and then we're going to go back into the sermon. I know this is, is confusing, but, but we're doing this for a reason. This morning's message is actually titled, A Radical Transformation, which means that something radical takes place, and, and then there is a change, there is something different, and so as part of this morning's message, we are going to fast forward a little bit into a series that we're going to start next week on the Ten Commandments. Now, you can notice that I have in my hand a stack of a whole bunch of papers. I'm about to pass out a pop quiz this morning for those in this sanctuary to write down the Ten Commandments. Now, a couple things. First of all, put your phones up, youth. Phones, iPads, tablets, everything, put them up. Put your Bibles to the side. Now, some of you may be saying, well, I don't know any of the Ten Commandments, and that's okay. That's o- it's not okay, but it's okay for now. <laughs> this is what we're doing. For those of you who, who, who have gone through um, psychology classes and or uh, different types of research study classes, you know that in order to have any type of hypothesis or, or to develop any type of thesis, you have to have a study group, right? So this morning, you guys are the study group, okay? So we're going to pass these out, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you about five minutes or so to write down the Ten Commandments. A couple, couple of things in, in doing this. First of all, it's okay if you don't know any of them. Just, just write on there, I really don't know. But, but I need a copy that I can say in our, in our study group, I can say, well, there was X amount of people that just didn't know any. Okay, if you know a couple, write down a couple. If you know all of them, write down all of them. Try to get them in the correct order. Exactly, exactly. I just, I just upped the ante a little bit, didn't I? Phil Gammer is looking at me like, I should have not come here this morning. It's all right. But the goal, the goal is this. The goal is that we are going to find where our baseline is as far as, as, far as how many of us know the Ten Commandments, how many Ten Commandments we know, and if we know them in the right order or not. I'm not going to share what the results were in the office when we took this quiz with me and Josh. It didn't turn out real well, but, but we kind of have a baseline now. We know, we know where we're at. And so the, the idea and the goal is that after we get done studying our Ten Commandments series over the next few weeks is that we're going to retake this test and we're going to see where we fall. So it's, it's a good idea and it's a good chance for us to to kind of see where we're at and, and what we're doing, and that way we'll know. Would you run these upstairs and pass them out up there for me? Thanks, Sam. And as soon as, as, soon as Kevin gets his, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set my stopwatch up here for, for five minutes. You can start filling them out now. That's fine. Just do not cheat. Shelby, your Bible better not be open to the Ten Commandments. Okay. <laughs> do not cheat. Just as best as best you can label out the Ten Commandments. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and start my stopwatch, and that way... That way we'll kind of know, and we're going we're to multitask a little bit here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go into this morning's message, but I want you to do your best 
do your best. Of the t- if you think like the first of the Ten Commandments is don't lie to your mom and dad, okay, write that one down. That's actually not one of them. But whatever you think it is, whatever you think the Ten Commandments are, write them down. All right. Well, how many of you, as, as you're thinking, as you're writing, as you're doing different stuff, how many of you have New Year's resolutions this year? Anybody want to raise their hands and say they have some New Year's You don't have to say what it is. You can just say that, yeah, I've made, I've made a couple resolutions. And, and, and members of my family, we've, we've made some resolutions, and we've talked about different stuff. And, and usually one of the, the biggest things is we want to, you know, we want to change some of the things that we're eating, or we want to, you know, honor our bedtime a little bit more, get a little bit more sleep, or, or maybe study God's Word a little bit more, or, you know, a lot of, a lot of times, a lot of times our New Year's resolutions uh, will reflect a lot about what we need to do, uh, and, and, and a lot of times, you know, almost, you could, you could probably take a poll in this room of what some New Year's resolutions are, and almost, I would say a high percentage of them would say, I need to lose some weight. Is that a fair statement that I think most people would, would that there would be a lot of, I need to watch what I eat. I need to lose some weight. I need to take better care of myself. I need to watch, you know, what I'm doing. I need to exercise more. And it, and it usually has to do somewhat with our health, has to do somewhat with how we feel, has to do somewhat with, you know, maybe our appearance. But there's a problem. There's a problem with, with our New Year's resolutions, and there's a problem that seems inevitable. We are busy. We keep ourselves busy. We don't seem to take the time that we need to to make some of the changes that we need to take. For those that maybe made a New Year's resolution to read God's word more, we get busy and we're like, oh, I just, I just don't have time today, I'll make it up tomorrow. And then tomorrow you'll say, well, I don't have time today, I'll make up the last two days tomorrow. And we keep pushing it off and we keep pushing it off. But I'm going to share a few things with you as we get started this morning about time. There are really only three Three time periods in our life, the past, the present, and the future. And these three are very closely related. Let me share with you just how closely they're related. Things happening now are the present. Three seconds ago, they were the future. And now, they're the past. Did you follow that? Right now is the present. Three seconds from now is the future. And now it's the past. And, and you could almost run yourself crazy trying to, trying to understand it and, and really grab hold of, of how this whole theory on time works. So I'm going to explain it just, just a little bit better. The past, the past is done, right? The past has happened. It can't be changed. Uh, you, you've been down that road. You know what is at the end of the road. You may have enjoyed it. You may have hated it, but you're really, you're really left with, with two choices when it comes to the past. You can either choose to forget it, or you can choose to learn from it. The present, the present is here and now, and it's, it's by far the shortest of the three. The present is constantly changing from the future to the past. It comes and goes, as the Bible would say, like a thief in the night. And you have very little time really to compl- contemplate some of life's great questions during this time of the present. And if you aren't careful, your opportunity to do so will slip into the past. And finally, there's the future. And, and, and the depiction of, of, of the future is, is short and sweet. It's also perhaps one of the most enjoyable of all the times because it, it holds the promise of, of hopes and dreams of things yet to come. But the reality is the future will be the present and then the past before you know it. Our inability, our inability to control time plays a vital role in God's ability to radically transform us. Let me say that again. I don't want you to miss it. Our inability to control time plays a vital role in God's ability to to radically transform us. Five, four, three, two. Let's see what my ringtone is. 
Uh, it's just a, it's just a beep. Nothing, nothing spectacular. You were expecting like some crazy song, weren't you? It's all right. All right, let's pick them up. Let's pick up your test. We're gonna, we're gonna break now. Would you pick up this side for me? Thank you. How do you guys feel like you did? Eh? Pretty good. Does anybody, does anybody think they got all ten? Does anybody? Do you think you got them in the right order? It, it wouldn't surprise me if you did. It wouldn't surprise me if you did. We, we will check them and see. Um, you didn't ha- I didn't tell you this, but you didn't have to put your name on it. If you did and you're like, oh, I won't look at the names, I promise. I promise I won't look at them. <laughs> you guys are like, I came to church this morning and he made me take a test. What's, what's up with this? Unfortunately, my New Year's resolution was every message from here on out, I have a test with it. So we're going to see. Some of you guys are like, I'm done, I'm out, I'm not, I'm not ever coming back to Northside. I appreciate you guys doing that, and, and like I said, as, as we begin our series on the Ten Commandments, you're going to be surprised, I think, when our series is over and we redo this test, you're going to be surprised at how many of you will remember most if not all of the Ten Commandments. And, and there's, a little, there's a little trick that we're going to do while, while we're going through this series that's going to help you with that endeavor. And now we're back into this morning's message. So for something to be radically transformed, well, what, what, what does that mean? It, it, it usually means that there has to be this process, there has to be a starting point, right? Similar to the baseline that we just took with the Ten Commandments test. There, there has to be There has to be a beginning point. There has to be something that you look at. And and, and like I said, you know, before, and and, and for myself, and and I know many many of us in here, we we, we can baseline and say, okay, well, this year I'd like to lose maybe, you know, 10, 15, 20 pounds. Uh, You know, so we have our baseline. It's it's where we are right now. Or we say, you know, I would like to spend at least 30 minutes reading or studying God's word every day. And so, so, so we have a baseline and we say, okay, right now, you know, some of you may say, well, it's at zero. Some of you may be at negative. I don't know how that would work, but, but it may be zero. You may be studying 10 or 15 minutes and say, I want to I wanna double that. But there has to be a starting point. There has to be step one, right? And, and, and as we were looking as, at our scripture this morning, and obviously we're talking about Moses. And Moses went from being a shepherd for his father-in-law to being a shepherd of God's children for his heavenly father. So there was a radical transformation that took place in the life of Moses, and and this plays out through the the book of of Exodus. And and, and we know that, you know, part of this transformation was was the giving and the receiving of the Ten Commandments and then going down to to all the rest of the Israelites and delivering them. And and, and, and we know from the the story that as he came down off the mountain, the the glory of the Lord was was shining on Moses' face. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But what's interesting, and, and I've talked about this before with you guys, it's, it's interesting and it's exciting to read the scriptures and, and, and to study the stories, but a lot of times the power of God's word doesn't really impact us until we can relate it personally to ourselves, right? And, and we can put ourselves in a position to say, I understand this point now. And, and that's really what, what I try to do when I teach God's word or when I try to teach a principle is, is Let's put ourselves in that situation. Well, now, it's hard for us to go to Mount Sinai and spend time with the Lord and come down with the radiance on our face. But, but some of you could probably think of some, some story or some example in your life where there was a radical transformation. And I'm going to share one of those stories um, ab- about myself with you guys for now. And some of you may not be aware of this, but when I was in high school, uh, our high school choir uh, team was asked to go to New York at the end of the school year and to join a number of other high school choirs and sing on Carnegie Hall stage. How many of you are familiar with Carnegie Hall stage? It's a very, it's a very prominent, uh, a very historical uh, stage there in in New York and and lots and lots and lots of famous singers have, have, have sung there and and various different concerts and, and, and this is a very prestigious, very prestigious place. Now, I'm going to share a few things with you that that you probably are aware of. We were high school students in high school choir class. Did we realize at the time what Carnegie Hall stage was all about? No. 
we had no clue. Uh, our high school choir class was, was basically fun time. Uh, it consisted of obviously talking and joking, and when you're standing up in between songs and somebody goes to sit down, you swipe the chair out from underneath them. Uh, you know, playing tricks on the teacher, playing tricks on each other, playing tag in, in, in the room. And yes, we're talking about seniors in high school. It happens. Am I right back there, youth? Yeah, I'm right. Yeah. We didn't have a clue. We, we acted like children. We were immature. But one of the last things, <laughs> one of the things that we would do that was probably the most irritating for the teacher is that we would play this game called The Last Man Standing. And anytime we would stand for a song, we should say, okay, and everybody sit down. The last one to sit lost, or the last one to sit won. So, so you would have people that would sit down, and you'd have two or three people that would stand, and they would just stare at each other, and they wouldn't sit down. And we would do this for like minutes and minutes and minutes, and the teacher would get, you know, madder and madder and madder as we went on. But it, but it was this idea of, of how, how belligerent can we be? How far can we push the ticket before she explodes or before one of us is willing to give up? And so this is just a, this is just a taste of, of who we were in high school choir. And so we get asked to go to, to New York, and, and we had sunk through the arrangement a couple of times in class, nothing big, because the, the composer who was actually conducting all of these groups had written most of this music. And so he, he really didn't want the individual high school teachers teaching it one way when we were going to get there and he was going to teach it completely different. And so in order for it to kind of be a, a ground zero, we all went without really knowing the music which we're thinking, this is great, we're going to get to hold the books, you know, it's just going to be fun time in front of a bunch of people, Carnegie Hall, and we couldn't have been more mistaken. We arrived in New York on a Saturday night around 10 p.m. We got off the airplane, went straight to the hotel, did not even go to our rooms. We went to the practice hall until midnight and practiced songs. We got up the next morning, had breakfast. From 8 a.m. until noon, we practiced. We had from noon until 6 p.m. to visit the different sites in New York. And then from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. for the next two days, that was our schedule. 8 a.m. to noon, break to go visit New York. 6 p.m. to 10, that's when we practiced. And and, and it was kind of shell shock for some of us because, first of all, we didn't expect that this was going to happen. We're like, this is going to be fun time in New York, and, and that's really not at all what it was. The differences in, 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 in the teaching style between our teacher and, and this composer were, were, were night and day. We found out long, long about Monday, Monday evening, there would be no books. There was no music. It was all from memory. We also found out as, as time went on, as we practiced and rehearsed, that from the second we walked out onto the stage, we were not allowed to move our arms. You were not allowed to scratch your nose. You couldn't fix your hair. You couldn't adjust your shirt. You were to stand like this for the entire duration of all the songs. And we sang about seven or eight songs. So we were on stage for 45 minutes or so. He didn't want any extra facial movements, no t- obviously no talking. That was a given. No talking, no joking, no touching, hands to your sides. And we were just to stand there and sing. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. You don't know some of the guys in our music class. This, this is never, this is never going to happen. But it did. And the sound, the sound went from some mixed tones, some people singing really good, some people really not doing anything at all. To as the as the couple of days went on, it they got a little bit tighter and a little bit closer, and 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 it started to harmonize a, a little bit better until the final night. We were an entirely different group. And somewhere, and I tried desperately this week to get my hands on it, somewhere there is a recording of us singing at Carnegie Hall on this little thing called a cassette tape. It's a little rectangular thing, kind of like an 8-track, but not quite. Um, somewhere there is a cassette recording of us, and I really wanted to get my hands on that to play it, you know, maybe a little bit of a song this morning to, to show that, that we went from a bunch of kids to sounding like professional singers in, in just a matter of days. The transformation that took place was unbelievable. And so with, with, with all that being said, but with all those things and, 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 and our little tests we're taking this morning, there are really three things, three things, and that's what I want you to focus on this morning, three things that happened 
or the three things that take place in order for there to be a radical transformation. Number one, the old must go. The old must go. We have to go through a process of leaving what we were by doing away with the things that we did or by doing away with the way that we acted. For those of you with, with the New Year's resolutions maybe of, of, of eating better or, or losing some weight or doing some more exercise, the way that this process happens is before we can go through this change, you have to do away with the way things were, right? We have to do away with the old. If our old habit and our old routine was get up, eat breakfast, eat lunch, eat dinner, and then about 10 o'clock at night, eat your second dinner, you probably need to do away with the second dinner. And I'm guilty of that more times than not. If, if, if you never jogged or you never exercised or you never worked out or you never did anything and your goal is to, is to get more physically fit, is, is to put on more muscle mass or, or, or to be able to run farther, you need to do away with not doing anything, right? You need to bring in something else. And so the first step is that we have to understand the old, the old has to go. The old ways, the old habits, the old mindset, whatever it was that was, that was keeping us where we were, that has to leave. As a, as a high school choir student, the thing for us before this radical transformation would take place, the thing that had to leave for us, was our shenanigans, right? The joking around, the playing around, the talking, punching people in the backs of the legs when they're not looking, making them fall down. You know, all those things that I know Josh deals with in his choir back here. I've, I've seen you guys practice. I know who sits on the back row. Christina tells me stories, but those things had to go, right? Before, and, and, and the composer's name was, was, was Bill, Bill Nuss, but before, before Bill could could radically transform this group, there were some things that on the front side he couldn't do it. And 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 once he made those things clear, you know, there was a couple of hundred of us there at that point from multiple places. <coughs> Excuse me. He made it clear that that wouldn't be tolerated. We didn't really know what wouldn't be tolerated actually meant, but we didn't want to find out. And so, you know, we we walked the line for, for those for those few days that we were there. But as a Christian, as, as we're talking about being radically transformed, as a believer in Christ, in order for God to radically transform us, the first step that we have to take is the old has to leave. And there's a couple of different ways that you can look at this. Obviously, you can look at the idea of, of, of a non-believer coming to Christ and, and, and what is the old that leaves, well, you, you would say that it would be your, 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 your sinful thoughts, your sinful nature. It, it stays with you, but you no longer act on those things. You're no longer led by the impulses and, 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 and the flesh. You are to be led now by the Spirit. So the old that would go is, is this idea of, of, of being under the law of the, of the spirit of sin and death, right? And we talked about that a few weeks ago. If we are Christians, if we've already accepted the Lord and, and we have the Holy Spirit, and, but yet we say, hey, God, I, I want a radical transformation in my life, but what are some of the things that has to go, what, what, is, what is the old? Maybe laziness? Maybe, maybe the thought that, that we're entitled to something that we're not? Maybe the thought that, that, that God is supposed to do something for us? Maybe it's the idea, for some of us, maybe it's the idea that we have already arrived as a Christian? Maybe it's, maybe it's that we don't study God's word enough. Maybe it's that we don't pray enough. But whatever that old is, for, for us as, as believers in Christ, we have to be willing to say, God, in order for you to make a radical transformation in my life, I need to get rid of this. I need to leave this behind. For some of you, it may be the amount of time that you spend at work. It may be that you have two gods, and I'm not saying God is in the form of, of our Heavenly Father, but, but maybe you idolize something that you're not supposed to. Whatever it is, 
whatever it is, as, as a believer in Christ, for God to make a radical transformation in your life, you have to be willing to let go of whatever it is that's holding you back. And I can, I can almost guarantee that each and every one of us, it would be something different. Each and every one of us have our own holdups that, that keep us from achieving all the things that God wants us to do. Number two, the old has to leave. The next step is that the new comes in. If, you're, if your New Year's resolution is, is, is this idea of, of losing weight or, or, or getting more sleep so, so, so that you can feel better, then, then obviously the new that comes in would be your eating habits, right? It, it would be that, that, okay, instead of having, you know, breakfast and lunch and, and then, you know, having six desserts after lunch, which sometimes that happens, right, is you say, okay, well, I'm not going to have dessert this time. Or, or you know, I'm going to eat a, a light lunch, then I'm going to eat a little bit bigger dinner, and then I'm not going to snack at 7 o'clock, and I'm not going to snack again at 8.30, and then I'm not going to snack again right before I go to bed. And, and, and yes, I speak, I speak from experience. I'm, I'm guilty of that. But the idea would be that the new, the new comes in, the new schedule, the new arrangement, the, the new whatever it is that's going to help me with this New Year's resolution. Maybe I say, okay, well, I'm going to spend a couple of hours each week at the gym, or, or I'm going to start running more, or I'm going to start you know, lifting weights. I'm, I'm going to do something I'm going to do something that's going to change, that's going to bring about this change in my life. The new has to be present. It's not enough just to do away with the old. The new has to come in. Our choir, our choir, this, this newness that came into our group was, was this new conductor, was this new, was this new teacher. It was a different style. It was a different method. He instilled in us this, this new understanding of the music that we were learning. He instilled in us this new understanding of how, as singers, we were supposed to sing the notes and hold the notes and how we were to breathe while we're doing all of this. And it was all, it was all things that were just new to us. But that's what brought about this, this radical change in our entire group. When we accept Christ, 2 Corinthians tells us that, that you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Couldn't be any more clear than that. When you become a believer, you're no longer, you're no longer bound by what and the way things were. You have been given new life. You've been given basically a fresh start. You have been given the Holy Spirit. You want to talk about a radical transformation? Watch somebody who, who lives life hard. Watch them accept the Lord. Watch the Holy Spirit come into their life, and you'll see a radical transformation. Many, many of you will remember the story that I told a couple of months ago about um, the, older, the older woman named Billy in New Orleans, uh, we were on a mission trip, and, and uh, my students had begun wit witnessing and, 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 and sharing the gospel with, with an older lady who owned an art store in a mall. And, and it, it was, it, they were just going round and round and round, and, and, and she was having them chase all sorts of rabbits. And, and they end up calling me, and they're like, we need help. We, we, we're, we, we, we're just, we, we can't talk to this woman. She's, she, we can't keep her focused. And so I come, and, and, and we talk for a few minutes, and... and and, um, you know, long story short, uh, I was having the same problem getting her to focus on, on what we were talking about with the gospel. And, and, and until, until there was this very clear break in the conversation, and, and all of a sudden she starts to hear what I'm saying, and the Holy Spirit starts to work on her heart. And I look over my shoulder, and all of my students are on their knees in the mall praying and binding Satan from our conversation. And, 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 and at that point, this woman, everything changed. And she accepted the Lord right there in the mall. She gave her life to Christ, and, and the Holy Spirit came in. And, 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 and we left shortly thereafter. I went out to the van and got a Bible and took it back into her. And the difference in her countenance and the difference in who she was from when I had first met her 20 minutes earlier until when I came back in with the Bible and she had the Holy Spirit in her heart, was, it was unbelievable. She, she was bouncing. She, she, she almost... She almost, in a spiritual way, had the, had the radiance of the Lord shining on her face. 
When we accept Christ, that, that same Holy Spirit comes into us and it changes everything. And for those of you, for those of you who are already Christians, for those of you who are already believers and you're thinking, well, what, well, what is it for me when, when we're talking about this radical transformation? What, what, what is it that I, you know, what's the new that, that, that comes in for me? It's your relationship with the Lord. While, while yes, when you accept Christ, you have that relationship and, 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 and you're going to heaven and, and, and you're walking with the Lord. But I would venture to say that most of us could be doing a much better job of that. And, and, and I'll put a plug in for tonight. Tonight's message is, is about our intimacy with the Lord and how that affects our impact in this world. And so, so if, if, you're, if you're interested more in that, come back tonight. I'll throw that teaser out there. But the idea is that however willing we are to allow God to work in our life, to bring in the new into our lives, that's how he's going to use us, and that's how we're going to see the most, the most radical of transformation. The final thing that happens, the final thing that happens in, in, in this radical transformation is the difference. It's the difference. The experience that, that, that I had um, in New York with, with, with my friends and with, with the choir, I will never, ever forget that. That, that to me was the first time that I had really seen something transform so quickly and so radically and have such, so have such a, an everlasting impact in my life. When we go through the change, when, when, when you go through this radical transformation, whatever it is, whatever happens, there has to be a difference. Something has to take place. The old goes, the new comes then there has to be something that shows that, right? Right? If, 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 if our goal again, and I'm just throwing this out, or is to lose weight, or is to eat better, or, or is to, to work out or exercise more, if, if the old goes and we do that right, and the new comes in, and we accept that right, then the outcome, we're going to see changes. Something, something will change. It may not be immediate. It may not be the next day. But over the course of time, it will change. I can guarantee you, if, if your goal is to grow closer to the Lord by reading his word, you probably won't see it the next morning. But if you continue to do it, the old goes, the new comes, and you study, you will grow closer to the Lord. It will happen. I, I guarantee it will happen. The book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, if, if you guys remember, and this is kind of off, this is kind of off what we were talking about, but remember when Isaiah was called up into the third heaven and, 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 and he had the vision and, 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 and he saw the glory of the Lord and, and, and the seraphims around the altar. And what was the first thing that he realized is that, is that he is a man of unclean people and a man of unclean lips. And he realizes that he should not be where he's at. And then the seraphim grabs the hot coal and he comes and he touches his lips. He's transformed. He's forgiven. He's then allowed to be in the presence of the Lord. And the very first thing that he says is, Lord, here I am, send me. That, and we're going to talk about this at some point, but that, that is the epitome of worship. That is why we come here on Sunday mornings. If you, if you leave here on a Sunday morning in the same spiritual condition that you came in, then you did not worship. And, 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 and that, that could be for, for a couple of reasons, you know, um. It could be that, 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 that Josh totally dropped the ball on worship, you know. He sang every song wrong, or it could be that I got up here and I was quoting stuff out of, you know, the dictionary and not, not God's word, or, or, or it could be that I didn't even preach God's word, or I just made stuff up the whole time that I was up here. It could be, it could be for those reasons, but, but the majority of the time, the majority of the time, he and I could totally mess everything up from the stage and from the pulpit, but you could still worship. You could still sense the Holy Spirit. You still could allow God to radically transform you. So 90% of the time, the holdup is us. It's, it's, it's our own fault. We don't, for whatever reason, allow the Holy Spirit to work on us. We become callous. A lot of times, I think we just ignore when we, when we feel that tug of conviction. 
But I want, I want you to think about that. If you leave worship the same way that you came to worship, you probably didn't worship. And that, that should put a huge responsibility on you. If you want, if you want to see a radical change this year, whether, whether it's whether it's something physical, whether it's, it's something maybe time-wise or, 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 or maybe within your families. If, if, if you want to see that change, you have to be willing to invest in making those changes happen. If you want to see a radical transformation on a spiritual level between you and God, really the only thing you have to do is be willing. You have to be willing to let God Remove the old, bring in the new, and then see the fruits of that change. My, my, my goal in today, uh, my, my prayer for you, my prayer for you is that you have, if, if you have maybe a passion or desire to be a different you this year, to see some changes take place, my desire is that you would simply be willing to let the Lord use you. And I'm, I, I'm sure, just like I was as, 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 a, as an immature high school student, and just amazed at the change that took place in my life, you will be the same way. When you see the change that, that God can bring in you, if you're just willing, it will be amazing. It will be radical. I'm going to have Josh come up. We're going to we're going to have our time of invitation. If the Lord has has spoken to your heart this morning, if if, if the Holy Spirit is is speaking to you, I, I would ask that you would that you would come forward and and not not come forward and to talk to me. You're welcome to, but I would encourage you to come forward and talk to the Lord. And and if He's dealing with you, if if, if you're struggling with something and you need somebody to pray with you, I would love to do that. Uh, one of our deacons would love to do that. If, uh, if you're seeking a church home and, y- and you think that Northside could be the place, I would love for you to come down and, 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 and pray about it. Come down and talk to me about it. Uh, we, we would love to see you here at Northside. I'm going to ask that you guys would stand as, as we begin our time of invitation.